and welcome to this video on exam technique. In this video, we're going to look at the um, LXL Unit 4 paper, which is General Principles of Chemistry 1. And so this looks at rates, equilibria, and further organic chemistry. So the whole point of these videos is to go through the, um, the past paper and to go through the answers as well. Um, but crucially, obviously, going through the answers, you need to know how we've worked out the answers as well, and I'll tell you how to do that. And the mark scheme doesn't necessarily tell you uh, how to work out the answers in some of these questions. So that's really the whole purpose of this video. So these are freely available on the Edexcel website, so you can get a hold of these past papers um, and have it in front of you, and you can try the question yourself, and then just go back and have a look at this video to see if you were right, and crucially, why the answer was right as well. Now, as you can see on the left-hand side of the video, we've got some links, uh, and these links allow you to skip to certain questions, so you don't have to see the whole thing. And um, like I say, this is obviously very important, um, because it's one thing knowing the content, uh, but it's another thing actually um, being able to apply it into an exam situation, and we call that exam technique. So uh, that's the main purpose of this video. Okay, so let's make a, let's make a start. So that's obviously the front page of the exam here. Okay, so we look at question one. And it says, um, the question is about four organic compounds, each containing two carbons. See and see here, we've got the four different types. And it says, which is oxidized by ammoniacal silver nitrate? So um, now we're going to look at each of these molecules here. Um, and this silver nitrate is a test for um, an aldehyde. So we're looking for an aldehyde out of this. That's an alcohol. That's a carboxylic acid. This is an acid chloride. And there's your aldehyde there. So this will be oxidized by that. So that would be um, B. So mark that with B. Okay, so looking at the next question, it says, what is the highest boiling temperature? Or which has the highest boiling temperature? Well, we're looking for a molecule with um, hydrogen bonding uh, and the most amount of hydrogen bonding. So that's going to govern the melting point of these things. Now, if we look down here, this has got hydrogen bonding because uh, it's got an OH, and um, this one doesn't, because we've got a carbonyl group on the end there, um, but this one does, this one's got two, this is a carboxylic acid, it has an interaction with the double bond O, and the OH as well, uh, so this one has got two sites of possible um, hydrogen bonding, so we're going to uh, obviously put this as C, because this one has got two possible sites with it being a carboxylic acid, so that one is the highest, um, uh, boiling temperature. Okay, and then part C. So it says 0 0.01 moles of each compound is heated separately with excess acidified sodium dichromate. Uh, which compound reduces the largest amount of sodium dichromate? So um, we're looking for a compound that can be oxidized the furthest. Um, what we're looking for here is an alcohol then, because alcohols can be oxidized to um, aldehydes and carboxylic acids, or if it's a secondary alcohol, it will be oxidized to a ketone. So if you bring this down here, um, this can't be oxidized. Um, this uh, can be, but only to one step. This one can be as well, but this goes two steps. So this is oxidized to an aldehyde first, then to a carboxylic acid. So this is going to use up the most amount of oxidizing agents. So in this case, it's going to be A. There you go. Okay, right, on to the next part. So, D. Now, it says here, 0 0.01 moles of each compound is added separately to identical volumes of water. Which solution would have the lowest pH? So, if you bring this sheet back, we're looking for the one which have the lowest pH. In other words, the most acidic. Um, this is the most acidic. Um, this would form a carboxylic acid and HCl as well. When you react um, an acid chloride with water, you produce HCl. Now, HCl is a strong acid. So this one, by far, is the will have the lowest pH. So the answer is D for that one. So we put cross on there, and that makes it into D. Okay, so on to the uh, next one. Okay, so this is question two, and uh, they've given us a series of graphs. So these four sketch graphs are shown below. We've got A, B, C, and D. Uh, and part A is saying which could be a graph for the concentration of a reactant on the vertical axis 
against time for against time for a zero order reaction. Okay, so we're looking for uh, this is a concentration of a reactant. So we're looking for a curve that's going to head downwards first because reactants are used up. So we've either got C or B, but then it says uh, against time for a zero order reaction. So um, basically, this is uh, going to have no effect. Uh, any change in concentration of this is going to have no effect. Uh, but it's against time, so it's going to decrease neatly and smoothly like this. So uh, the first one is going to be B. Okay, and then the next one, it says, which could be a graph of rate of reaction on the vertical axis against the concentration of a reactant for a first order reaction? Okay, so... Um, it says this is the graph of rate of reaction on the vertical axis. This is how fast the reaction is going against the concentration of a reactant uh, for the first order reaction. So we're looking at the rate. Now rate uh, means if it's first order, it means as we increase the um, concentration, um, the uh, rate of reaction should increase by the same amount. So if we double the concentration, then the rate should double. So we're looking for a nice linear um, curve here so we're just going to bring that down so your linear curve in this case for this one is going to be D so you can see that's increasing so there you go so the rate's going to increase as the concentration increases so that's going to be D okay right on to the next bit I'll just put it to one side so we use that again right so question C or part C which is that one there so it says which would be a graph of rate of reaction on the vertical axis against the square of the concentration of a reactant for a second order reaction. So this is going to be important, the square bit. This is a second order reaction here. Um, so if we bring this back. So this is rate of the vertical axis against the square of the concentration. Normally what you would get with a second order reaction is you get a curve. Um, but because this is a squared function, this actually turns it linear again. So um, this one is actually going to be D again. So if it wasn't squared, then you'd get a curved graph, which is a classic sign of a second order reaction. So that one's D. Okay, and the next one, which would be a graph of the concentration of a reactant on the vertical axis against time for a reaction, which is catalyzed by a product? Right now, this is, a, this is an important one here. So it's going to be catalyzed by a product. So in other words, as the product is formed, that's going to be the basis of a catalyst. So we're looking for a curve which starts off slowly because we have very little product, um, but then accelerates as product is produced and then slows down again because the reactants have effectively been used up. And you can see there's only one curve that really fits that criteria, and that is C here. So it starts off slow because not much product has been made, but as product it forms, as product is formed, it catalyzes the reaction, speeds the reaction up, and then it starts to slope off again here because your reactants have been used up. So um, this one's actually going to be C. So put a cross on there. Okay, right, so on to the question three. So question three, move that up there. So question three says, which, which of the following mixtures would be the best buffer solution with pH 9? for use in a school laboratory, right? So this is a, a, an alkaline buffer solution. So, um, and to make a buffer, you need a weak base and its salt. So the only one there, which is the weak base and its salt is um, D. So ammonium chloride is the salt and ammonia is the weak base. So that's gonna be D. Okay. So on to the next part. Right, so question four. Um, it says select the correct pH for each of the following solutions. So there we go. Let's drag it down there. So uh, we've got two molar nitric acids. So in this case, um, to work out the pH, it's just the minus log of H plus ions. Um, because this is nitric acid, it's a strong acid. Nitric acid is HNO3. Okay. So in this case, it's going to be a uh, minus log of um, two. Uh, and if we stick that in our calculator, you can see here we'll put minus log of 2, and then we should get an answer of minus 0 0.3. So that's going to be B. There you go. Uh, and the next bit, it says a 
0.1 mol dm cubed barium hydroxide with a Kw of 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Right, so um, Kw, let's write down our equation for Kw first. So Kw equals the concentration of H plus times by the concentration of OH minus. Okay, this is a bit of a tricky one. Um, let's just write in this number here. 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So that's the uh, Kw. Uh, we need to work out H plus, um, but we know OH minus. Now, this is a strong base, so we assume it fully dissociates. So the number of moles of this, the concentration of this, equals the concentration of OH minus. But crucially, um, this actually kicks off two OH minuses. So this is dissociating by two. So this concentration here needs to be doubled because this will give out two. So um, we'll put concentration of H plus there. Uh, and this is going to be times by 0.20. Okay, that's really, really important. Don't forget that bit. So if we rearrange this, the concentration of H plus is going to be 1.0 times by 10 to the minus 14 divided by 0 0.20. Uh, and then if we bring in our calculator again, so that's going to be 1.0 uh, times by 10 to the minus 14. Divide that by 0 0.20. And we're going to get 5 times 10 to the minus 14 which we'll put there, uh, and then we just use our normal pH equation, so that's going to be the minus log of 5 times by 10 to the minus 14, uh, and we're going to get 13.3, so that's going to be B. There you go, so yeah, you have to watch out for that one. Okay, and the next one, so there's a mixture of two cent 20 centimetres cubed of one molar uh, hydrochloric acid and 10 centimeters cubed of one molar sodium hydroxide. Right, well the first thing we need to do is to work out the number of moles of each of them. We've reacted them together and um, we're probably going to have an excess of one of them. So let's work this out. So we've got moles of HCl um, and that's going to be the number of moles is basically concentration times volume. So the concentration is 1, so it's just going to be 1 times by the volume which is 20, that needs to be in decimeters cubed, so I'm going to put times by 10 to the minus 3, because that means divide by 1,000. Uh, and then, obviously, we put that in, we don't really need to calculate it for that one, so that's just going to be 0 0.02 moles. Uh, and then we need to work out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, which is NaOH. Again, that's going to be 1 times by, this is 10, so 10 times by 10 to the minus 3, uh, and that's going to give us 0 0.01 moles. Uh, now you can see uh, we have more moles of HCl than we do sodium hydroxide, uh, and so what we say is we have an excess uh, of HCl by 0 0.01 moles. As you can see, we've got 0 0.01 moles more HCl than we do sodium hydroxide. So um, once we've worked that out, uh, we then need to work out the uh, concentration um, because ultimately we need to work out a pH equation. So we know we've got an excess, so the concentration um, is going to be, uh, let's put this in here, it's going to be the number of moles divided by the uh, volume. Now this is the total volume, because we've got 10 and 20, so we'll put that over there, 0 0.01 divided by, total volume is 30 this time, 30 times by 10 to the minus 3, because we need to convert that to decimeters cubed, so we divide it by 1,000. Uh, and then if we put that into our calculator, so it's 0 0.01 divided by 30 times by 10 to the minus 3, and that's going to get us uh, 0.33, da 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 da, so it extends. And then if we do work out the pH, this is the, basically this is the concentration of our HCl. Because it's a strong acid, we assume that the concentration of HCl equals the concentration of H plus ions. So therefore we do our minus log of that number there, which is 0 0.33. So let's put that in there, 0 0.33. And you should get an answer of 0 0.48. In this case, it's going to be C, which goes there. So it's quite a lot there, quite a lot involved. Okay, and the next question. So it says ammonia reacts with water in a reversible reaction. Which are the bronsted lowry bases? Okay, so a bronsted lowry base is a proton acceptor. So um, an ammonia reacts like this. It's sometimes helpful to write out the equation. 
So ammonia reacts with water. It's in equilibrium to form ammonium, NH4+, plus, plus OH-. minus. So the ones which are accepting base uh, a proton here is NH3 is accepting a proton, as you can see. That's the difference. Uh, and on this side, OH- minus would accept a proton to form water. So the two which we are looking at is NH3 and OH-. Minus. So 5 is B. There you go. Right, so on to the next question. Okay. Right, so question six. So question six is uh, looking at the formula of an acid, uh, which is present in fingerprints, and it's shown below. So if I just drag this down here, so you can see it, that'll be useful. Um, so there we go. There's our formula there. And it says the systematic name of a oleic acid is, and we have to try and work it out. Now, the C... You can see the key thing here, we've got a double bond, and we have these two groups on the same side. So because these are on the um, same side, we know it has to be a Z. So anything with E in it um, is not going to count. So immediately we've whittled it down to B or D. And the next thing we have to do is look at the number of carbons. You can see here that we have um, uh, 7 and 8 here, 9, 10. And then another seven, one of the eight on this side, so that's going to be 18. So octadec is fine. And basically, we're just looking for where is this double bond? Is it on the ninth carbon or is it on the eighth carbon? You can see here that we've got eight carbons here. There's carbon nine, then carbon 10 on that side. So we always um, label number the lowest number. So this is carbon nine, so it has to be B. So it's nine enoic acid because that double bond sits on carbon nine and 10, but nine is the lowest number. That's it there. Okay, and next one. So, which intermolecular forces are present between oleic acid and or between oleic acid molecules? Well, um, you can see that we've got obviously we've got some hydrogen bonding here. We've got COOH um, hydrogen bonding with carboxylic acids. So, if we have hydrogen bonding, it means we will have dipole dipole and uh, high and um, London forces as well. So, we'll have all three. Um, it's very, very important. You don't just have uh, hydrogen bonding. If you have hydrogen bonding, you will have all the other two as well. Um, so um, in this case, the answer is going to be C. Go. And then part C. It says, which of the following species is most likely to cause a peak at, M at ME45 in the mass spectrum of oleic acid? Right, so um, we are looking for uh, a fragment that will produce 45, that's going to be a carboxyl group, because if you add all these up, that's going to give you 45, but the crucial thing is, because it's a mass spectrum, mass spectrometers uh, will detect positive ions, remember they're ionized first, and then accelerated through the mass spectrometer, so actually in this case, um, it's going to be this one here with the positive charge, not that one, so don't get these two mixed up, it must be a positive charge if it's detected in a mass spectrometer, so that one's going to be D. Okay, right, and the next one. It says, what would you expect to see if oleic acid is tested separately with bromine water and with phosphorus pentachloride, or PCL5? Right, the first thing, oleic acid has that double bond, remember? So if we go back up there, there you go, the double bond. So the first thing, bromine, and when you add bromine to a double bond, it will decolorize. So it's between A and C. Uh, and then with PCL5, when we react PCL5 with this, PCL5 reacts with um, alcohols or anything with an OH group in, so a hydroxyl group. So this one does have an OH group, it's carboxylic acid, and what it will form is effectively this OH bit will drop off and you'll have a Cl instead um, that's formed on there. So you'd get these um, white misty fumes that's been formed because it's a, a, a sign of a acid chloride being formed. So you get these steamy fumes being produced so this one has to be A. There you go. So it's just testing two different functional groups there. Okay. Right, on to the next part. This is the final page. So you can see here that we've got question seven. Starts off there. Let's pull that down. So uh, question seven, it says, methane hydrate is found on continental shelves deep in oceans. It forms methane in an endothermic equilibrium reaction, which may be represented as this. And we've got it here. Which of the following changes would increase the equilibrium yield of methane? Right, so what we need to say 
is that um, this thing is endothermic going forwards. So we'll put that positive on this side. So it's an endothermic reaction. So if I want to produce more of the methane, I'm going to have to um, I'm going to have to increase the temperature because what will do if I increase the temperature, the equilibrium will shift to try and decrease the temperature, which means to the endothermic direction on the right, and that means we'll get more of this. So the first thing we need to say is increasing the temperature. So in this case, again, it's between A and C, and then we need to look at the pressure. Um, again, if I to get more of this, remember pressure is only to do with gas. So we have no moles of gas on this side and one mole of gas on this side. So if I decrease the pressure, start with A, then um, what's going to happen is the equilibrium is going to shift to the right to increase the pressure, which is the side with the most number of gaseous moles, which is the right-hand side. So in this case, it's going to be A. Okay, right, on to the next one. So it says, which of the following would decrease the value of the equilibrium constant Kp for the above equilibrium? Right, so Kp uh, is effectively the partial pressure of the product, I'll just put prod on there, uh, divided by the partial pressure of the reactants. Now, if we want to decrease the value of Kp, which is this number here, we need to have this, the reactant value, effectively increasing. So we need to effectively shift equilibrium to the left-hand side to increase the amount of reactants. So the only way in which I can do that is effectively by decreasing the um, temperature. Because if I decrease the temperature, which is this one here, um, then effectively the equilibrium will shift to try and increase the temperature, which is the exothermic direction. Remember, exothermic direction was going this way, and that's going to give us more reactants to effectively reduce the Kp. So this one is going to be that one, which is there. And the final question, which is question eight, it says, when one optically active isomer, 3-chloro-3-methylhexane, reacts with hydroxide ions to form 3-methylhexane or hexan-3-ol, a racemic mixture forms because... Now, when we're looking at racemic mixture, that means we have an equal uh, number of enantiomers. We have a 50-50 mix. And the reason why we can form this is because actually we form a carbocation intermediate. Um, so that is the one that we need to be taking, or crossing, should I say, which is A. And uh, that's the end of part A. So we're on to section B. Okay, so this is section B, uh, and it's question nine. So it says this question is about magnesium chloride, MgCl2. It can be formed by burning magnesium in chlorine. So uh, we've got Mg solid and Cl2 gas, and we're going to form MgCl2 solid. We've got the entropy of the surroundings here. It says, remember to include a sign and units in your answers to the calculations in this question. So it says, A part 1, the standard molar entropy at 298 Kelvin for one mole chlorine molecule, Cl2, is plus 165 joules per mole per Kelvin. Use this and appropriate values from your data book to calculate the standard entropy change for the system, which is delta S system, for this reaction. Okay, so um, the system, let's get the equation down just to make it really clear. Um, so we we'll want to work out the entropy of the um, system. Uh, and this is basically the sum of, let me put this kind of symbol here, this Greek letter, uh, S theta products. Uh, and we're going to subtract that by the sum of the entropy of reactants. So that's an S there. Doesn't look that clear. There you go. Um, and so therefore, what we have to do is look at the entropy of our um, products. So what we have to do is look for the products, which is magnesium chloride. Now, if you look in your data book that you get in the exam, you should see that this should come out as a number of 89.6. We're going to subtract that away from the um, reactants. So the reactants, again, is um, 32.7 for our, um, put that on there, 32.7. And then uh, we've also got the addition of this one, which is Cl2, uh, and this is 165. So this is the one for magnesium. Um, so this is going to be uh, 165. So this is for the chlorine, because they've given us that one. Put that in brackets, uh, and then obviously bring in our calculator. Let's work it out. 
So let's leave it there. So it's going to be 89.6. Subtract that away from 32.7 plus 165. Close the brackets. Press the equals. Uh, and we should get minus 108.1. And the units are joules per mole per Kelvin. Or they could be joules per Kelvin per mole. It could be either way around, but that gets you the answer there. So you get two marks for that. You get one mark for showing you're working, and then one mark, obviously, for your final answer. So you get two for that one. Okay, right, so on to the next one. So it says, explain fully why the sign for the standard entropy change of the system Delta S system is as what you would expect. Okay, so what we're looking for is um, a few things really here. But the first thing, if we come back to the equation, if I just pull that up slightly, so you can see if we look at the equation, we're going from a, a solid and a gas to a solid. So we're going from a less ordered system to a more ordered system. So that's going to give us that negative entropy value. So um, it's two marks. So we just need to try and explain that in, um, in a few different ways. So basically, we're saying that we have. Um, a solid and a gas uh, reacting uh, to form a solid. So there's one point, uh, and then you can say, obviously, comment on the on the disorder. So uh, we have a decrease. in disorder or you can say more ordered uh, disorder uh, as solid is um, more ordered uh, than gas so anything like that will get you um, both the marks so you get one mark obviously making a comment on the you know what the according to the equation we're going from a solid to a gas and then another mark which is commenting on the actual order uh, of the molecules and linking it back to entropy okay so on to the next one so let's push that there so it says calculate the total entropy change delta s total in joules per mole per kelvin for this reaction given your answer to three significant figures right that's really important that three sig figs so uh, let's write down the equation first so we're going to have the um Delta S theta total, uh, and that's going to equal the change in entropy of the surroundings uh, plus the entropy change under standard conditions of the system. So that just helps us to clarify our thoughts, really. Uh, the entropy of the surroundings, now they told us earlier on, if I just pull this down here, told us the entropy of the surroundings was this number here. So we're going to put that down into there. So the entropy of the surroundings is going to be uh, 2152. And we're going to add that to the uh, system, which we worked out before, which is the number just up here, that one. That was the entropy of our system. So I'm just going to pull that down just so we can see it. So that's going to be, uh, obviously, that's going to be a minus 108. Point one, uh, and then right. If we put that into our calculator, let's bring that in here. Okay, so we've got two one five two, and we're going to add that to minus one oh eight point one. There you go, and then let's see. Okay, so we get this number here, which is two oh four three point nine. So we're going to put that in there. Two oh four three point nine. Uh, right, uh, and then the crucial thing, this is the important thing, because it did say three significant figures. So we need to convert this to three significant figures. Uh, and so that would be 204. This would turn into a zero because there's your three significant figures there, and anything after that is converted to a zero. Um, so, yeah, and the, the units you can put, obviously you can write them in there if you want. So that's joules per mole per kelvin. They've told you them anyway at the top, but it's always worth it. Uh, two marks, one mark for obviously writing this in, and then one mark for your three significant figures. If you didn't do the three significant figures, um, you lose that mark, so that's really important. Okay, right. On to the next bit. Okay, so it says, uh, part C, it says use the standard entropy change of the surroundings 
uh, to calculate the standard enthalpy change delta H in kilojoules per mole for the reaction at 298 Kelvin. Right, so the enthalpy of the surroundings, so let's just write our equation there. Entropy, sorry, should we say? So the entropy of the surroundings. And this is an equation that you just have to remember. Is minus delta H divided by the temperature, which in this case is 298. So we're just going to write that there. Um, now, if we rearrange that, um, you can put something like, um, obviously, the enthalpy change equals the delta S of the surroundings. I'll just put sir at the bottom there, times by 298. Right, so we want to work out this bit here. So to do that, we just obviously, let's write it down there. So this is the enthalpy change. Um, we need to work out the entropy of the surroundings. Now that was 2152. Uh, two. We have the minus um, in front of there. Let's put the minus because we've shuffled that along. So that's going to be minus 2152 times by 298. So that was that number that was at the end of the equation, just what we'd seen before. Uh, and if we put that into our calculator, let's put our calculator back in. So that's going to be minus 2152 times by 298. And that's going to give us this number, which is minus uh, 641296. So if I convert that into kilojoules per mole, um, we have to move the decimal point uh, back three places. So we go one, two, three. So that's 641.3. Because we round that number up in kilojoules because it has to be in kilojoules per mole. So that's going to be minus 641.3. That is kilojoules per mole. There you go. Uh, two marks for that one as well. So you get one mark for obviously using your numbers correctly, and then one mark for your answer as well. So you get two marks in total. Okay, so the next question says 0 0.0300 moles of magnesium chloride prepared by burning magnesium in chlorine is added to 51.5 centimeters cubed of water. 50 centimeters cubed of one mole per dm cubed solution is formed, and the temperature rise delta T is 22.5 degrees Celsius. So we need to calculate the energy transferred in joules for this process using this equation here. So this is a really straightforward equation, really. Um, volume of solution that we've made is 50. That's what we're looking at. Um, we're going to multiply that by 4.2. Uh, and then we're going to multiply that by a temperature change, which is 22.5. Uh, bring the calculator back in again. Let's just stick it there. Okay, so we've got um, 50, which is that number there. 50 times by 4.2 times by 22.5, put that in, and we should get 4725, as you can see on there. So 4725, uh, and that's going to be in joules, because that's what the question asked for. There you go. Okay, right, and then the next part says, calculate the enthalpy change of solution, delta H solution, of magnesium chloride in kilojoules per mole. Right, so uh, what we have to do is to work it out in kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to take this number here, which is the energy. Uh, also, um, this value here as well, because we're working out this is the energy transferred. This is exothermic. So it's going to put a minus in front of there. Uh, and that's important because we need to make sure the signs are correct. So it's minus 4725. Divide that by 0 0.0300, because that's the number of moles. So if we come back up to here, that was the number of moles that we used. So we put that into our calculator. There's a lot of calculation in this, as you can see. Let's bring this across over here. Right, so we're going to have minus 4725 divided by 0 0.0300 equals, we get this massive number here. Now, our enthalpy change of solution has got to be in kilojoules uh, per mole. So, again, this is in joules, remember, because that number was joules. So, we need to basically move the decimal point back three places. That's one, two, three. So that's 157.5 kilojoules per mole. Remember, that's negative as well. So it's minus 157.5 kilojoules per mole. There you go. And the marks actually come in for 
uh, one mark for your answer, then one mark for the sign. So the sign is really important here. Remember, this is a, an exothermic reaction, so it must have that negative sign there. If you miss out the negative, uh, you won't actually get that last mark there. So that's really important. Okay, right, and on to the next one. Okay, let's drag this down here. Okay, so it says the enthalpy change of hydration of Mg2 plus gas is minus 1920 kilojoules per mole. Use this, your value from D part 2, and the experimental lattice energy from your data booklet to calculate the enthalpy change of hydration of Cl minus gas. Right, so I think the best thing to do here is to kind of label our diagram, what we've got here. This is going from the ions in the gaseous state to the um, solid lattice. So this is called the enthalpy. This is the lattice enthalpy. So put delta H uh, lattice. Okay, that's that one there. Uh, and then we're looking at this one here, which is going from a solid crystal to aqueous ions, or ions in the aqueous um, state. So this is going to be the enthalpy enthalpy of solution. I'll just put sol on there. Uh, and this one here, let's put that there. This one here is going to be going from the ions in the gaseous state going to ions in the aqueous state. So this one is your enthalpy of hydration because we've hydrated the ions. So enthalpy of HYD, so hydration. Okay, so that's really important because we need to know these different parts here to help us understand what's going on. Now, it asked us to work out the um, enthalpy change of hydration of Cl minus. So we know the enthalpy change of hydration of Mg2 plus. So that's a bit of this. So we know that one, but we don't know this bit here. So what we need to do to understand, we can use this cycle, and we can say actually this value and this value has got to equal this value here. They've got to be the same. So we're going to write up an equation here. So this is going to be delta H of the solution plus the enthalpy for the lattice, which is these two here. That must equal the enthalpy of hydration of Mg2+, plus, which we have already because we've got that number there, and the enthalpy of hydration. Uh, and this is going to be of, um, I'm going to put 2 in front of there because it's Cl-, minus, and we actually have 2 of these. So we must, must include that 2. That's very, very important, as you'll see. Um, later on. So if we put our numbers in there then, so we're going to use the uh, enthalpy of um, uh, the enthalpy change of the solution first. Um, now that was the value that we worked out in the, just in the last question there. So that was minus 157.5. So that was the one from D part 2, that one there. Uh, and we're going to add that to the lattice enthalpy, the lattice enthalpy um, is minus 2526. Now you need to look for that in the data book for that one. So this is the lattice enthalpy for um, this going to MgCl2. So this one is going to be minus 2526. Go. Uh, and that's going to equal the enthalpy of hydration of magnesium 2 plus, which we, they've given us here. So that's going to be uh, minus 1920. Uh, and we're going to add the enthalpy change of the 2Cl minus, which is what we're going to look for here. So we're then going to obviously rearrange this. So we're going to take this, bring this over to this side, and work out what 2Cl minus is. So if we flip that over the equal sign, that changes to a positive. So what we're going to have is minus 157.5 plus minus 2526 plus 1920. Uh, and that should give us just what 2Cl minus is. So if we bring our calculator back in again. So we've got minus 157.5 plus minus 2526 uh, plus 1920. And we should get a value of minus 763.5. That is the value for 2Cl minus. So to work out what 1Cl minus is, uh, we need to divide that one by 2. So we're going to write that there. Minus 763.5. Divide that by 2. So we've got the number there already. So we're just going to divide that one by 2. 
uh, and that's going to get us minus 381.75. Okay, and so that number goes in there. So you get three marks for that one. Um, so let's look at where the marks come in. You get the marks for obviously using the cycle, some indication that you've understood what the cycle's about. Uh, you get one mark for obviously rearranging your formula to work out what 2Cl minus was, were, uh, and then one mark for working out obviously the final answer there, which is the 381.75, and it has to be negative because it's exothermic. Okay, so next one. So it says draw a diagram to represent a hydrated chloride ion, right? So um, this is basically just chloride ion with water surrounding it. Um, I like to see these things a little bit like celebrities. So the CL minus is like the celebrity, uh, and the paparazzi are photographing the celebrity. So this could be like uh, water molecules surrounding the celebrity. But obviously, the bit which is attracted to the minus is the delta positive of the water. So um, when you're drawing your molecules, make sure you're drawing them so you've got hydrogen uh, pointing towards uh, the Cl minus. Now you can draw just like just like several of these, but four should be sufficient. Um, so as long as you've got the hydrogen pointing towards the Cl minus, it's not the oxygen, that would be incorrect. So that gets to the one mark. And then the last bit, which is this one here. So you suggest why the addition of anhydrous magnesium chloride to water results in an increase in temperature and a decrease in volume. So um, basically when we um, add the uh, anhydrous magnesium chloride to water, we're going to form some interactions between the ions and the water molecule. So this is an exothermic process. So we're going to put that on there. And so hydration of ions um, is exothermic. Uh, and we, or we can also say that bond formation releases energy, so you can say anything like that. So any of them really that they'll they'll do. Uh, and then the last bit is the volume decreases. Now this is interesting. Obviously, when you put a uh, hydrated powder in there to the water, the volume decreases even though the water hasn't really disappeared. So we need to understand why it's decreased um, and that's because the water molecules are now more tightly arranged. Um, so we'll put that there. Um, or we can say they are more ordered. Um, as they are uh, clusters, the water molecules, we should say, as they are actually clustered around the ions. So, yeah, you get one mark for either or. You know, one of them and one of them. So you get two marks in total. So there we go. Total for question nine is 17 marks. So um, that's it. On to the um, next question. Okay, so this is question 10. And question 10 says, a flow chart for making 2-hydroxy, two 2-methyl two butanoic acid from butan 2 ol is shown below. And you can see we've got a flow chart here. And it says, give the reagents and conditions for step one. Uh, so this is, as you can see, we're going from an alcohol to a... Uh, keep going. So this one's going to be uh, potassium dichromate. So I'm just going to nudge that up there. So I'm going to put in that is a quite a common oxidizing agent. Uh, and we have to mix that with uh, sulfuric acid because it has to be acidified. So it's acidified potassium dichromate. Um, and obviously, we're going from uh, this to a ketone, so secondary alcohol to a ketone. So this is going to be um, a reflux. You can also say um, distill as well. Although reflux is generally the one that, that's the most accepted. Okay, so you get two marks for that. You get one mark for saying potassium di dichromate and sulfuric acid, and then one mark for reflux and distillation. Okay, so the next question. 
So it says butanol is formed in step one. Give a chemical test to identify the carbonyl group and a further test to show the presence of the CH3C double bond O group. For both tests, give the observations that you would make. Okay, so the first one, basically a test for carbonyl group is uh, 2,4-DNP or 2,4-DNPH. So these are just tests that you just have to try and remember. So 2,4-DNP uh, or also known as Brady's reagent. Uh, and what you would observe is you would observe a, now it could be yellow or orange, uh, or they will accept red as well. It depends on, obviously, on the brain's reagent you're using, uh, and you're going to precipitate. Very important to include the word precipitate in there. There you go. So you get two marks. Uh, one mark for saying your reagent, and then one mark for saying, obviously, what you would see. And then the next bit, is then um, how you would test for the CH3CO group. Uh, you would use iodine, uh, and that would be in alkaline conditions. Uh, and what you would observe is you'd see it would should go, uh, it should turn a pale yellow or go cloudy slash cloudy there you go okay so you should get another further two marks there so this is just standard chemical tests you've got to just try and remember them okay so good on to the next one okay so this is a mechanism a love mechanism so it says in step two Butanol undergoes an addition reaction with HCN in the presence of CN minus ions. Give the mechanism for this reaction. And we've got three marks here. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw down, obviously, our molecule. So it's going to be CH3, CH2. It's got a bond between them two. Um, and then uh, carbon, double bond oxygen, CH3. So there is our um, ketone. And then we've got our cyanide group as well, lone pair, negative charge. Uh, and right, and so what's going to happen is the electrons from here is going to go onto the delta positive carbon. This is delta positive because we've got the oxygen next to it. And that's going to push the electrons onto the oxygen there. And that's the first thing. And then if we write out the uh, molecule again, C. Oh, right, this has a minus charge now because the electrons from the double bond are being pushed onto this oxygen, so we've got this intermediate. The CN has added itself onto the bottom there, and obviously we have CH3 on the end there. Now, what you would have is you could have an extra CN molecule or water will actually provide um, the extra proton to turn this into an alcohol, and the electron goes from here onto the delta positive hydrogen, and then that them electrons then jump onto there uh, and you form a cn minus so the actual product should be uh, ch3 ch2 coh cn c triple bond n and ch3 uh, and obviously we'll have cn minus as well as a product okay so you get three marks for this so the first mark comes in by drawing these first two arrows here so there's your first mark there. Your second mark comes for drawing your intermediate with the O minus on there. And then your third mark is for this arrow. So showing that you're going to actually take the proton and form it into an alcohol, which is the last step there. There you go, three marks. Okay, so on to the next bit. So it's by considering the mechanism of the reaction, explain why the addition of hydrogen cyanide to butadone gives a solution which has no effect on the plane polarization of uh, plane polarized light. Okay. So basically, we you can see that we have a um, we actually have a chiral center here. There it is. There. So the only way which we won't rotate plane polarized light is if it's a racemic mix. So that's the first thing we need to say. Really, I'm just going to bullet point these as well. So a racemic uh, mix is formed. So that's the first one. 
Uh, and again, we need to say that the bonds around the um, uh, in the original molecule we started here, they're actually quite flat. These are planar. So that means we can have an equal chance of this cyanide either approaching from the top or approaching from underneath. So um, because of that, then that allows us to have this racemic mix because there's an equal, equal chance of it uh, attacking from either side. So we're going to put that on there. So bonds around the carbonyl group are planar. That's really important, really important point that you've got to say. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the cyanides can attack uh, from above or below. There. So I've tried to make that easy to see where you get your three marks from. So um, you can see here, you actually get one for comment that a racemic mix is formed, one for saying that the carbonyl group is planar, and you have to remember that point because that's quite important. And then your last one for saying that because it's planar, the cyanide has equal opportunity to attack from either underneath or on the top. So that is quite important. Okay, so on to the next bit. So this question C part one, suggest the type of reaction occurring in step three. Right, so if we bring this sheet back, See here, this is step three here. So we're going from uh, a cyanide, which is over here, and we're going to produce um, this group here. So we're changing the cyanide to a carboxylic acid. So you can see here, the, when we're going from a cyanide to a carboxylic acid, we need water. So this is hydrolysis. Hence the word hydro, like water. So we're going to put in there hydrolysis. Okay. And then uh, the next bit, which is part two, says explain why the presence of the alcoholic hydroxyl group cannot be confirmed in the infrared spectrum of 2-hydroxy, 2-methyl butanoic acid. Well, actually, what you'll find is, if we bring over our, bring over our sheet here, you can see that the, if we find the alcohol bit, uh, if we can see it, there it is. Okay, so the alcohol bit will actually um, overlap, uh, or the OH absorption of the alcohol will actually overlap with the uh, carboxylic acid uh, OH group as well. So um, that proves to be quite difficult to, to actually identify them. So we're actually going to put that down there. So let's put that on there. So with the OH absorption. absorptions for the alcohol and the carboxylic acid these overlap and that's why it's sometimes really difficult to distinguish whether it is an alcohol or whether it's actually part of a carboxylic acid so that one's just for one mark okay go to the next part So, okay, so it says for part three, the hydrogen of the alcohol group in 2-hydroxy-2-methylbutanoic acid can be identified by a single peak in the NMR spectrum. Give the chemical shift you'd expect for this peak. So this is the hydrogen in the alcohol group. Again, if we bring this back in. Okay, you can see there's our uh, alcohol group, which is down here. Let's bring that back into focus. So it's there. And you can see that the number is between two and four. So that is effectively what we're going to use there. So put there 2.0 to 4.0. Okay. And then IV, it says explain why in high resolution NMR, the peak due to the hydrogens of the 2-methyl group in 2-hydroxy-2-methyl-butanoic acid is a singlet. Uh, and that's basically because we don't have a hydrogen atom on the neighboring carbon. And that's why we get a single peak. So we're going to put that on there. So we have no hydrogen atom of the neighboring carbon. Okay, there you go. So that's that one there. And uh, that's always the case with the singlet as well. So that's why we have a singlet peak. So this is, remember this is the N plus one rule. So 
Um, you can see here that the singlet is N is the number of hydrogens on adjacent carbon. Obviously, in this case, there's none. Plus one, and it gives you the singlet. So that's the rule that it's following. Okay. And then the last bit, it says molecules of two hydroxy, two methyl butanoic acid react together to form a condensation polymer. Um, draw a displayed formula for this polymer showing the two repeating units. Right. So um, we're going to, go to draw the molecule down for space. We're going to draw them like vertically like a column instead because that helps. It does say displayed as well. So we have to draw all the bonds, which is a bit annoying, but. Never mind, we have to draw them anyway. Right, so we have the uh, alcohol group here. So the H is chopped off the end because that's going to link with another with another polymer. Remember, this is uh, condensation. So water has to be eliminated from the molecule. So we take a hydrogen from the alcohol and then an OH from the carboxylic acid on this side. And so that's when we take that off, then that actually joins together. So here's our carboxylic acid group there. And then this oxygen is from the alcohol group of uh, the other molecule. Because we have to show two repeat units. So so this is exactly the same. So four carbons coming down here. Show all the bonds. Okay, and then here on this side, just like with this one, you have your carboxylic acid group. The OH from the carboxylic acid group is chopped off, um, and the H from the alcohol group on the other side is also lost, and they combine to form water, hence condensation polymer. So um, this actually just extends outwards. So you should have your brackets with your trailing bonds. There you go with your trailing bonds showing that's really really important but you can see here that's that's what we've lost here then you get two marks for this you get one mark for the uh, drawing of the whole structure because obviously that's very important there uh, and then you get one mark for also drawing your ester link this is your ester link here so this is showing the carboxylic acid of one group this oxygen has come from the oh of another so if i just cover that bit up you would have had an oh on the end of here if it was a carboxylic acid group we'll lose that and we lose the hydrogen from here. This would have been an alcohol. And so we lose the hydrogen from there. So they two bonds form water. So it is very important that you know how to how to draw these things. So there we go. That's the end of uh, question 10. And you get 18 marks. So pretty good. On to the next question. Okay, so this is question 11. And question 11 says, per sulfate ions, s 2 minus oxidize iodine ions in aqueous solution to form iodine and sulfate ions, SO4 2 minus. Write the ionic equation for this reaction, and we're going to uh, state symbols are not required as well. So uh, they've basically told us what the uh, what the uh, equation is. So um, they say uh, per sulfate ions, which is S two O eight two minus, and that's going to react with iodide ions. So we're going to put I minus ions. Uh, that's going to produce sulfate ions, which is SO four two minus. And we're also going to form iodine as well, which is I2. So all we have to do is balance it. You can see we've got two sulfurs there, so we need two there. We've got I2 there, so we need a two there. And that's it. There's your marks. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, so the next part says the effect of persulfate ion concentration on the rate of this reaction was measured. A few drops of starch solution and a small measured volume of sodium thiosulfate solution were added to the potassium persulfate solution. Potassium iodide solution was then added at the time taken and the time taken for the mixture to change colour was measured. The reaction was repeated using different concentrations of potassium persulfate, but the same volumes and concentrations of sodium thiosulfate solution and potassium iodide solution. So the rates of the reaction were compared using the reciprocal of the time, which is just one over time. Uh, for the mixture to change colour as a measure of the initial rate. So this reaction is basically just the iodine clock. Um, and it's a great reaction because you can measure the rate of reaction and you can visibly see the change because um, because of the iodine. So, and then obviously the change, it's saying what is the final colour of the reaction mixture? We should see this bluey black colour starting to form. So we'll put that in there. Uh, blue slash black. Okay, right. Uh, next one, it says, what would happen if the reaction was carried out without the addition of sodium thiosulfate? Well, what would happen is the solution would turn back like straight away, which is not what you want. You want it to um, want the reaction to obviously t 
to, to run. You want to measure the rate of the reaction. So we're going to put that in there. So the solution uh, would turn blue slash black uh, straight away. There we are. Okay, so the next one. So it says, explain why the concentration of iodine ions remains constant until the mixture change colours. Well, what actually happens is that as soon as the iodine reacts, uh, so, so as soon as the iodide reacts to form iodine, um, it's actually reduced back to iodine by the thiosulfate ions. So it basically um, allows you to, until obviously until the mixture changes colour, this means that the iodine ions effectively remain constant. So we're just going to write that in there. So soon as iodide reacts to form iodine, um, it is reduced uh, back to iodide by the Thiosulfate ions. Okay, there you go. So that's the uh, that's the first bit done. Okay, right. Okay, on to the next one. So this is they've given us a, a set of uh, data here, and it says the results obtained from the experiment in part B were tabulated as follows. You see, we've got the concentration of our uh, persulfate ions, which is here. And we've got the time, and then we've got the um, reciprocal, which is 1 over time down here. So it's literally just 1 over whatever that number is, and this is the number you get. So we have to plot a graph of 1 over time on the vertical axis against the concentration of persulfate ions. Right, so let's just nudge that up there so we can see the graph. There we go. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to put in our... So this is going to be the concentration of persulfate ions. Uh, and that's going to be in moles per decimeters cubed. Okay, so that goes there. Uh, and then we're going to have, over on this side, we're going to have 1 over time. Uh, and this is measured in s to the minus 1, as we see over there. Right, so we need to make sure that we have a, a scale that obviously fits. Uh, and you can see here, obviously, the this starts at point naught naught six. Uh, and then it's going to go up to one. So actually, we don't have to start it in this case at the uh, at the zero zero. So we're just going to put point naught naught six there, point naught naught seven zero there, point naught naught eight zero there. Okay. So that gives us a decent scale. Remember, our graph has got to be over half um, of the actual uh, axes that they've given us here. Uh, and then the 1 over time, again, it starts at 0 0.0150, uh, and it's going to go up to 0 0.0250. So we need to try and get a scale that obviously fits this, this parameter here. So we can go for uh, 0 0.015, so we can put that there, and then we can do uh, 1, 6, 1, 7. So we can go 1, 6, 1, 7, 1, 8, 1, 9, and then we can start here, which is 0 0.020. So that'll spread out quite nicely. Uh, and then 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5. There you go. And that, that seems to, let's see on the end there, that seems to actually make it um, nice and neat. Okay, so then all we have to do is then plot our uh, data. So we've got 0 0.060 is going to 0 0.0150, so put across there. Uh, and the next one is 0 0.075, which is this line, and it's going to go to um, it's going to go to 0 0.0188, as you can see on there. So there's the data. So what I'll do is I'll just plot them on here. But if you if you've got the paper in front of you, you can see the actual numbers. So it's 0 0.075, uh, and that goes to uh, 0 0.0188. So that's going to be where are we? 6, 7, 8, 8, 8 is there. Uh, and then we've got um, 0 0.09. Uh, 
0.009, sorry, uh, which is 0.0225. So that's going to be there's two one, two two, two five is somewhere along there. Uh, and then we've got 0 0.0100 is 0 0.250. So let's just draw that up there. Okay, and then if we get our ruler, line the best fit. Obviously, you draw that with pencil instead of a pen, but you get a nice, neat graph. It should something should look something like that. Uh, you get two marks for this. You get one mark for actually uh, getting your correct axes correct. So I'll just put one one on there. So your axes are making sure your scales correct. You get your second mark for making sure you've got a sensible. You've used a sensible amount of the actual graph. In other words, over half, uh, and you've drawn your line of best fit with your plots pointed correctly. So I'll just put the two there and making sure that obviously it's a sensible, sensible scale for two. So you get two marks for that. Okay, right. Okay, so it says one over time is a measure of the initial rate of the reaction. Deduce the order of the reaction with respect to per sulfate ions and justify your answer. Okay, so you can see from that graph that we had before, it was a straight line graph. So this is a classic sign of a first order. So it's first order. Uh, and basically what we need to say, the reason why is because the rate increases... Uh, linearly, there you go. Okay, so basically it's just a straight line. So um, two marks for that, which isn't too bad, I don't think. So you get one mark for first order, um, one mark for the rate increases linearly. Okay, and um, the next one it says the re uh, the reaction is first order with respect to iodine ions. Write the overall rate equation for the reaction and deduce the units uh, for the rate constant. All right. Okay, so. Uh, it said it was first order with respect to iodine ions. It's also first order um, with respect to S208 as well. So we put rate equals K, the concentration of S208 to minus times by the concentration of I minus. Uh, because it's first order, obviously we have a one there, but we don't put it in. We just leave it as that. Uh, and then the units for this is going to be uh, uh, dm cubed, mole to the minus one, s to the minus one. Okay, so you get two marks for that again. So you get one mark for your rate expression and then one mark for your units as well. So not too bad. Okay, on to the final part of this question. So it says here, the reaction in part B is repeated at two different temperatures, keeping the initial volumes and concentrations of the solutions constant. You can see here we've got two temperatures, the uh, 1 over time, which is the reciprocal, 1 over T, which is this here, uh, and then the natural log or the ln of 1 over time, which is this value here. So you can see this is the Arrhenius equation. So this is useful for working out, or well, useful, it is useful, uh, working out the activation energy. And surprise, surprise, that's exactly what they want us to work out. So this calculate without drawing a graph the activation energy of the reaction. Remember to give your to give a sign and units with your answer. Right, okay, so let's just nudge that up there. Okay, so there's our they've given us the equation here that helps us to work it out. Now remember in our graph, um, when we're plotting these, I'll just draw a little graph over here. So you have uh, 1 over t, which is down here, which is this bit, uh, and then with these as well, you have the natural log of 1 over time, which is over here. So effectively, uh, remember, 1 over time is the same as rate as well. So effectively, we've got this bit is the y-axis, and uh, this bit is your x-axis. So what we're left behind, the graph that's drawn here, would be the gradient, and the gradient is actually this bit here. So the gradient, so that's the first thing we need to say, is that the gradient... Because that's got the activation energy in there, which is Ea. So the gradient uh, is effectively minus uh, Ea divided by R. Uh, and if we can rearrange that, because obviously we want to work out the activation energy, that's minus R uh, times by the gradient. Okay, and so that's the equation we're going to use there. 
Okay, so the next thing we need to do is obviously work out the uh, gradient as well. So the gradient is obviously the change in y over the change in x. So the gradient with y being obviously the vertical axis, which is up here. So uh, the gradient is the change in y. So if we come back, y was 1 over time. So 1 over time, if we just lose that down there, is this one here. So the natural log of 1 over time. So it's minus 0 0.300 0, uh, minus minus 3.69 so let's let's draw that there okay so the gradient equals minus 3.0 and working out the difference so it's minus 3.69 and then we're going to divide that by the change in uh, 1 over t which is this bit here so you can see here's the here's the two numbers here so we're going to work out that difference there so the uh, Equation should look like something like this 3.30 times by 10 to the minus 3 minus 3.41. Uh, yeah, 3.41 times by 10 to the minus 3. Okay, and then if we put that in our calculator, so let's do uh, minus, let's just pull that to one side. Okay, so we've got minus. Uh, 3.0 um, minus minus 3.69. Okay, so we press equals on that. So that's 0 0.69, and we're going to divide that answer by 3.30 times by 10 to the minus 3, uh, and we're going to subtract that away from 3.41, which is there times by 10 to the minus 3 and we should get uh, this value here so minus 6272.7 uh, let's just round that up okay so we're going to get minus 6272.7 um, so this is the uh, this is the gradient uh, and There you go. So this is the uh, this is the gradient that we're going to use here, and then what we have to do is then work out the uh, activation energy. So we're just going to notice that up there. So the activation energy, E A, which is uh, this one here, and we're going to that's going to be minus R times by the gradient. So we're going to have uh, minus R, which is uh, this one here. Sorry, that's in Kelvin, that unit there. So this one's eight point eight point three one. And that's going to be multiplied by the gradient, which is minus 6272.7, which is there. Uh, and then if we put that into our calculator, and we should come up with our activation energy. So let's put that there. Right, so we've got 8, whoops, minus 8.31 times by minus 6272.7 equals uh, and there's one of there five two one two six point one three seven um so we'll just write down that there five two one two six um so that was point one so if we just leave it as that that's joules per mole uh or if we're going to convert that to kilojoules per mole which is probably more sensible is fifty two point one kilojoules per mole and there we go. Right, so we get three marks for this, so a decent number of marks. So the first mark comes in by working out the fact that the activation energy is R times the gradient. Uh, we get one mark for actually working out this value here, which is the actual gradient, the value of the gradient. And then one mark for substituting all the numbers in, and we get this one here. So that's our final answer. Okay, right, and on to the last section. So it says, suggest how the reliability of the activation energy determination could be improved without changing the apparatus, solutions, or methods. So this is a classic how science works question. Uh, anything to do with improving reliability without changing the equipment is repeating it. So you can do it in, in, in a few different ways, really. So we'll put uh, repeat at the same temperatures. Uh, or you could you could do you could just take readings at different temperatures as well. 
So we'll put that up there. Take readings. Out. Different temperatures. All right, so obviously that gets you one mark. So either one of them, for repeating it, would effectively improve it. So um, there we go. That's question 11. And on to the uh, last question, which is question 12 on section C. Okay, so this is uh, the final section. So section C, um, this is question 12. And it says this question is about an experiment to determine the equilibrium constant Kc for the reaction between ethanoic acid and ethanol to form ethyl ethanoate and water. Two sealed test tubes were prepared. The first test tube contained 0.04 moles of ethanoic acid and 0.04 moles of ethanol and 0.2 centimeters cubed of concentrated hydrochloric acid. The second test tube contained 0.04 moles of ethyl ethanoate and 0.04 moles of water and 0.2 centimeters cubed of concentrated hydrochloric acid. After starting at 25 degrees Celsius for two weeks to ensure equilibrium is reached, the contents of each test tube were separately titrated with 0.2 moles per dm cubed sodium hydroxide solution. 0.2 centimeters cubed of concentrated hydrochloric acid was also titrated with the same sodium hydroxide solution. Right, so this is a, a, a classic kind of um, uh, equilibrium reaction because we're taking, we're basically making an ester, um, and this can take, like I say, it can take about a week or two weeks for it to establish equilibrium properly. And so basically, we're going to titrate it with a with a um, sodium hydroxide. So if we're titrating it with sodium hydroxide, obviously we're measuring how much acid is left in the reaction after equilibrium has been established. That's that's the kind of whole point of this. Okay, so let's have a look at the. Um, first question here. So it says using data from the data booklet, calculate the volume at centimeters cubed of 0 0.04 moles of ethanoic acid. Right. So um, the first thing we need to do is obviously work out the mass. We can work out the mass from this as well of the ethanoic acid. And what we can do in the data book, we're looking for the density. So if we work out the mass, we can work out the volume because we know the density of the liquid. So uh, mass equals, and uh, it's the number of moles of ethanoic acid. You see we had 0.04 moles. Uh, the molecular mass of ethanoic acid is 60.1. Uh, and you can use the periodic table for that. We just need to work that out. So if we bring in the calculator, 0.04, we're going to multiply that by 60.1. And we should get 2.404, that's in grams. Okay, uh, and then the volume uh, is basically the mass that we've just worked out, and we divide that by the density, uh, and so the mass is 2.404, so we've worked out there, divided by the density, so bring in the data sheet here, just so you can see what it looks like, uh, we're looking for ethanoic acid, which is there, that's it, or known as acetic acid. Uh, and the density is this one, that's where rho is there. So it's 1.049, that's the number we're looking for. So we're going to put that in there. 1.049, put that in our calculator. Let's bring that in here, so that's 2.404 divided by 1.049. And that should equal... Took a while for it to work it out there. Uh, 2.2917. So let's just put that there. 2.2917. And we can, or we can say that's effectively 2.3 centimeters cubed. Right. And you get uh, you get two marks for that. So you get one mark for working out your mass, one mark for working out your volume. Okay, there you go. So not too bad. Right, so the next part. So it says, what would be the best piece of apparatus to measure out the volumes of the liquids for the sealed tubes? These are really small um, volumes as well that we're using, 0.2 centimeters cubed. So measuring so that isn't really going to be the best thing here. So what you'd use, you could use something like a syringe, uh, or you could use a, a graduated pipette. So like a really, a really small one. Uh, but it means you can measure it out precisely. Uh, pipette. 
Uh, or you could actually use a burette as well. So anything like that. Burette can uh, measure that volume out quite quite easily, so that's good. But certainly not a measuring cell, though. It's the, the volumes are, are far too small. Okay, so it so suggests a reason why the test tubes were sealed. Um, now, this has to be a closed system. If it wasn't sealed, then some of your, the, the chemicals we're using here, some of them are quite volatile, and so you'll get evaporation, and that would affect equilibrium. So we need to basically do that to prevent uh, evaporation. Uh, or we can say to keep a closed system. Okay, right. Uh, on to the next question. So it says, suggest a suitable indicator for the titration of the equilibrium mixture in either test tube with the expected colour change. And we've got to justify our suggestion. So with this type of reaction, um, we're really looking at um, phenol, uh, phenol tholine. Okay, uh, and basically the colour change, it will go from colourless with this particular titration, and it'll go to like a pink or pale red colour. Um, so that's the colour change. And the reason why we do this is because um, actually the ethanoic acid is a weak acid, um, and the indicator, the pH range, coincides with the vertical section of the titration curve. So if we had our, well, let's write that down here first. So put ethanoic acid. Say weak acid, uh, and we can say that the the indicator pH range coincides with the vertical section. Of the titration curve. So what we mean by that is that if we have our titration curve there, we get this kind of like classic S shape here. You want your indicators to change within that that band there. You don't want it to change anywhere else. So it must change within this vertical section of your titration curve. So that that's that's what we mean by that. So we get three um, we get uh, three marks for this. So you get one for obviously seeing phenolphthalein. One for your colour change, and then one for your justification there, for your indicator. Okay, right, the next bit. Okay, so it says, in this experiment, the following titers were obtained. And you can see we've got, obviously, the titration. We titrated these solutions, remember, we let them go to equilibrium, and then we titrated them with sodium hydroxide solution. We have the first test tube, the second, and we have the uh, concentrated hydrochloric acid that we used as well. Uh, and it says write the equation for the reaction between ethanoic acid and ethanol to form ethyl ethanoate and water using structural formulae. Uh, state symbols are not required. Right, so we just need to write our, obviously our reaction here. So this is going to be CH3COOH. We're going to react that with CH3CH2OH. Make sure that's an equilibrium. So for CH3, COO, CH2, CH3, uh, and water as well. It must be structural as well. So you've got to make sure you write the letter CH3, CH2. You can't give the molecular formula, otherwise you'll lose the mark. Okay, so that's that there. Um, pretty straightforward. And it says, calculate the number of moles of ethanoic acid present at equilibrium in the first test tube. Right. So what we've got to do, um, because we used hydrochloric acid, when we're titrating our um, the contents of the first test tube with the sodium hydroxide, uh, we actually have um, some, some of this, uh, some of the volume of the sodium hydroxide would have reacted with the hydrochloric acid that we added to the test tube in the first place. So what we have to do is discount the fact the we have to discount the hydrochloric acid or the reaction with the hydrochloric acid so we're only looking at the volume of sodium hydroxide that reacted with the ethanoic acid so one way in which we do that is just by subtracting these two away from each other so i'm just going to write that on there 
just to make it clear because it is it's, it's, I think a lot of people will probably miss that bit out but it is important so the volume of sodium hydroxide uh, reacting uh, with ethylic acid is 77.1 and we're going to subtract that away from 11.7 there and then if we work that out it should be 65.4 centimeters cubed okay so that's the volume of sodium hydroxide reacting with the actual ethanoic acid and then all we have to do is then say right well then we need to work out the moles uh, this is the moles of ethanoic acid Uh, the reason why we can say this is actually we're going to work out the number of moles of alkali added, uh, but it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so this is going to be 65.4 times by 0.2. Um, this is concentration times by the uh, volume. So the concentration was 0.2, and the volume is 65.4. That's what we've just worked out there. We'll divide that by 1,000. And then if we put that into our calculator, so we know the volume is 65.4. What I'm going to do is just going to put that. That means divide by 1,000. That means the same thing. I multiply by 0.2. And that's going to give us 0 0.01308. 1308. Uh, or... That could be 1.308 times 10 to the minus 2. So you can write it in standard form or or just, just like that if you want. Uh, so this is the number of moles, so I'm just going to put moles on there. Okay, now you get two marks for that. You can probably see where the marks come from. One mark for actually working out how much the sodium hydroxide was reacting with the ethanoic acid, so the volume. And then one mark for working out the number of moles as well. Okay, right. On to the next part. So it says deduce the number of moles of ethanol present at equilibrium in the first test tube. Well, if this is the uh, number of moles of ethanoic acid, from our equation we can see the number of moles of ethanoic acid and ethanol is a one-to-one -one ratio, so the moles is going to be the same. So uh, we're going to put 1 1.3, 1.308 times by 10 to the minus 2 moles. So that's a nice easy one. Uh, and then it says... Uh, calculate the number of moles of ethyl ethanoate formed at equilibrium in the first test tube. Well, all we have to do is we started off with uh, 0.4, uh, 0 0.04, sorry, uh, moles of your uh, of your product. So we started with this here. However, at equilibrium, we had this amount left. So if we subtract how much we had at the start against how much we have at the end, we should be able to work out how much of the um, ethyl ethanoate we had left. So we're going to put 0 0.0. 400. So that was the initial number of moles, and we're going to subtract that away from 1.308 times by 10 to the minus 2. If we put that into our calculator, 0 0.0400 minus that from 1.308 times by 10 to the minus 2, and we should get 0 0.02692. So put that in there. And that's moles. Uh, okay, and on to the next one. So it says write an expression for the equilibrium constant Kc for the reaction, assuming the number of moles of water and ethyl ethanoate present at equilibrium are the same. Calculate the equilibrium constant Kc. So Kc equals, and we have the concentration of CH3COO. CH2, CH3, and water. So these are your products. Remember, it's products divided by the concentration of reactants, which is CH3, COOH, uh, CH3, CH2, OH, that's the alcohol. Uh, and then if we put our numbers in, so we assume that these two are the same. So we just worked that out in the previous question there. So that is going to be 0 0.02692 times by 0.02692 divided by uh, 0 0.0138. Multiply that by 
0.01308. That was the number of moles we had right at the start. And then if we put that into our calculator, let's just bring that in here. So put that in there. So that's 0.02692 times by 0 0.02692 equals, and we're going to divide that by 0 0.01308 times by 0 0.01308. And we should get this value here, 4.23 or 4.24. So, oops, camera's just gone wonky. Okay, so put our answer in there, so that's 4.24. Okay, so you get two marks for this. You get one for writing your expression and one for your actual value there. Okay. Okay, so VI, explain why the equilibrium constant for this reaction has no units. Uh, basically, we need to say that the units cancel out. So if I just bring this back in. So you can see here that the units, that's moles per dm cubed and so is that, and that's moles per dm cubed and so is that, so they effectively cancel out. We've got equal numbers on the top and the bottom. So we just need to say that the units cancel out. Or the units cancel. Okay, so why, in fact, is the number of moles of water present in the equilibrium mixture greater than the number of moles of ethyl ethanoate? So uh, what we need to say is that obviously the water has come from a different source as well. Another source of water is the hydrochloric acid that we've added um, as a catalyst. So um, we need to say the hydrochloric acid contains water, and that's why we have um, a little bit more than normal. So we'll put that in there. Hydrochloric acid. Uh, it contains water. Okay, and then part C, part one. Uh, what is the type of reaction that took place in each test tube? So the first test tube um, was where we had the ethanoic acid and ethanol. So that one's going to be a stamification because we're forming an ester. Okay, and the second test tube is basically just go backwards, uh, and we call that hydrolysis. And in particular, we call it acid hydrolysis because we had hydrochloric acid in there. Okay, so we get two marks for that. Obviously, you get one mark for esterification, and one mark for acid hydrolysis. Okay, and the next question. So it says, comment on the value of the titer for the equilibrium mixture in the second test tube compared to the first test tube. And it says, what characteristic feature of equilibrium reactions is demonstrated by the values of these titers? Right, so I bring this sheet back in again. And you can see here that the values are actually, uh, if you look there, they're pretty similar. In fact, very, very similar. So um, they are actually concordant as well. So um, there's a concordancy between the two numbers. Uh, so what that means is obviously we just need to say in here for this question is that the um, values are similar or we can say concordance uh, and then we can say obviously another point is well what does that mean because we have to say what does that mean about that it means that the reaction is reversible is reversible uh, or we can also say um, or we can also say something like the rate of the reverse reaction equals the rate of the forward reaction so anything like that but you basically get um, two marks for this one mark for saying that the values are similar or you say concordant and then one mark for saying that the reaction is reversible that's what it tells us okay well to the last part so it says state the mole of the concentrated hydrochloric acid in the equilibrium reaction. So the mole of this is it acts as a catalyst. So esterification needs a catalyst for it to work. So I'll just put catalyst there. And there we go. 21 marks for question 12. So not too bad. And that brings us to the end of this question. And actually this paper as well. That's it. Bye bye.